that you've been looking for. As you may recall from high school biology class, you have 46 chromosomes. 23 are from your father and 23 are from your mother. And it's that unique combination of chromosomes that determines everything from the color of your eyes to the number of hairs on your head. Part of your identity comes from your heredity. Now the mathematical probability that you would get the exact 23 chromosomes you got from your father is 0.5 to the 23rd power, or 1 in 10 million. But the same is true for the 23 chromosomes that you got from your mother. So if you multiply those two together, the probability that you would be you is 1 in 100 trillion. But then you also have to factor in that your parents' chromosomal history had the same probability and their parents and their parents' parents and so on. So the point is that you are incalculably unique and God intended you to be you, not a cheap imitation of somebody else. For our study today, I'd like to take you to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and an episode in David's life beginning at verse 38. This is his epic battle with a giant named Goliath. King Saul is still around at this point, and here's what we read. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He tried, for he had not proved it. He hadn't proved the armor. He'd never used it before. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. He took the armor off. And here's what he did instead. And David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. You know, David couldn't be Saul and he couldn't dress like Saul because Saul's armor didn't fit him. And he certainly couldn't fight the enemy like Saul because he would have lost. David had never used armor. He'd never used a sword. That would have posed a greater danger to him than Goliath. He probably would have cut off his own head with that sword. However, David was deadly with a slingshot, and he knew it. So he made a choice that would forever determine his destiny, the choice to be himself. Around the turn of the 20th century, a pioneering psychologist named Alfred Adler proposed the counterintuitive theory called compensation. Adler believed that perceived disadvantages often prove to be disguised advantages because our disadvantages force us to develop attitudes and abilities that would, other, would otherwise have gone undiscovered. And it's only as we compensate for our disadvantages that our greatest gifts are revealed. 70% of the art students that Adler studied actually had optical animalities. They had eye problems. He observed that some of history's greatest composers, including geniuses like Mozart and Beethoven among them, had degenerative traces in their ears. They had hearing problems, and yet they were brilliant composers. And Adler cited a multiplicity of other examples from a wide variety of vocations of people who leveraged their weaknesses by discovering new strengths. Adler concluded that perceived disadvantages such as birth defects or physical ailments and even poverty can be springboards to success. And that success is not achieved in spite of those perceived disadvantages. It's actually achieved because of those disadvantages. There have been many subsequent studies and they've added credibility to Adler's theory. In one study of small business owners, for example, 35% of them were self-identified dyslexics. While none of us would wish dyslexia on our children because of the academic handicap that comes with it, that disadvantage forced this particular group of entrepreneurs to cultivate different skill sets. Some of them became more proficient at oral communication because reading was so difficult for them. Others learned to rely on well-developed social skills to compensate for the challenges they faced in the classroom. And all of them, every single one, cultivated a work ethic that might have remained dormant if reading had come easy for them. Perhaps no individual illustrates Adler's theory of compensation better than Nick Vujicic. Born in 1982 in Brisbane, Australia, Nicholas came into the world with neither arms nor legs a limbless son 
was not what nurse Dushka Vojacic and her husband, Pastor Boris Vojacic, had been expecting. How would their son live a normal life? What could he ever do or become with such a massive disability? But little did they or anyone else know that this helpless, limbless baby would one day be a man who would inspire and motivate thousands of people from all walks of life. And now, at 28 years old, this limbless young man has accomplished more than most people accomplish in a lifetime. Since his first speaking engagement back when he was 19, Nick Vujicic has traveled around the world, sharing his story with millions of people, speaking to a range of different groups, like students, teachers, youth, businessmen and women, entrepreneurs and church congregations of all sizes. Nick has also told his story and been interviewed on various televised programs worldwide. And as he often says, if God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then he will certainly use any willing heart. Well, watch with me now as Nick introduces one of his video projects for students called No Arms, No Legs, No Worries. I wasn't ready. I have no arms and no legs, but I'm very thankful that I have my little chicken drumstick here. <laughs> People freak out when they see me for the first time. It's so cool, I was at a water slide um, all by myself. Everyone obviously at the bottom of the slide is looking up and waiting for other people to come down and here I come and they're freaking out. They're like, you know, like this. And I was so tempted to look at myself and go, what happened? You know? And there were times where I sort of looked at my life and thinking, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And you keep on concentrating on the things that you wish you had or the things that you wish you didn't have and you sort of forget what you do have. And there's no point, I believe, in my life where I wish I had arms legs, I wish I had arms legs, I wish I had arms legs, because wishing won't help. But what I've seen in life are just a couple key principles. And the first thing that I've seen is to be thankful. It's hard to be thankful, man. I tell you, when I was eight years old, I, I sort of summed up my life and thought, I'm never gonna get married. I'm, you know, I'm not gonna have a job. I'm not gonna have a life of purpose. What kind of a husband am, am I gonna be if I can't even hold my wife's hand. It's a lie to think that you're not good enough. It's a lie to think that you're not worth anything. One point. Woo! It's freezing, I can't feel my hands. <laughs> I love life. You know, so many people come and say, how come you smile so much? And I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> but it's very simple at the same time. You see, it's very hard to smile sometimes in life. There are things that happen that you don't know and you don't understand and you don't know if you're going to get through it. You know, you go through your storms in life and you don't know how long this storm is going to be. And today I want to share with you some principles that I've learned in my life that you can use in yours. Being patient is beautiful. I, I tell you, it's the hardest thing. But I realize I may not have hands to hold my wife's hand. But when the time comes, I'll be able to hold her heart. I don't need hands to hold her heart. You know, it is scary to know how many girls have eating disorders. It is scary to know how many people are just angry at life because of their situation at home and angry at others. It's scary to know how many people actually feel like they're worth nothing. Every single girl right here, right now, I want you to know that you are beautiful. You are gorgeous just the way you are. And you boys, you're the man. <laughs> On this DVD, I share my experiences in life of how I've overcome challenges, and seen a new, fresh perspective in life. To be thankful, to dream big, and to never give up. I speak to children, youth, and adults 
about key issues and principles that I've applied in my life that has given me the strength to conquer all that comes before me. Wow, that's quite a video, quite a story, and quite a life. You know, our greatest advantages may not be what we perceive as our greatest advantages. Our greatest advantages may actually be hidden in our greatest disadvantages, if we'll learn to leverage them. Your destiny is hidden in your history, but it's often hidden where you would least expect to find it. It isn't just revealed in your natural gifts and abilities, it's also revealed in the compensatory skills you had to develop because of the disadvantages you had to overcome. Compensatory skills is a brilliant term uh, coined by Alfred Adler to tell us exactly what happens in our minds and in our lives as we overcome great obstacles. Paul experienced this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. God said unto Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and in distresses for Christ's sake. And here's Paul's uh, punchline. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul developed some compensatory skills in life living for God. David's greatest advantage was the result of a perceived disadvantage. And without that disadvantage, he never would have fulfilled his destiny. You see, every past experience is simply preparation for some future opportunity. God doesn't just redeem our souls. He also redeems every one of our life experiences. And no, not just the good ones, but the bad ones too. How does he do that? Well, he does it by cultivating character, developing gifts, and teaching us lessons that can't be learned any other way. And if you learn the lesson God is trying to teach you through your circumstances, please let me tell you that you have not failed no matter how things turn out. You've learned the lesson God wanted to teach. Let's go back to the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 for a moment. In verse 33, Saul says to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. I really don't think Saul had a lot of confidence in David, but that didn't matter because David had a lot of confidence in God. Every wild animal that attacked David's flock was like a pop quiz. You remember those from school. They always came at inopportune times and you never felt prepared. But if you passed, you accomplished something and you learned something for the future. Every animal that attacked David's sheep, that was a pop quiz sent by God. Now, David could have failed the test. He could have sacrificed his sheep for the sake of his own safety but he passed each and every task by risking his life for his flock. And in the process, what happened to David is he cultivated a compensatory skill. It would change his destiny and it would also change Israel's history. It looked like David was at an obvious disadvantage. He wasn't even in the army. Surely it would take a trained soldier to face a fighting machine like Goliath. David didn't even know how to wield a sword or throw a spear because all he'd ever been doing was tending sheep. But that perceived disadvantage actually gave him a great advantage over Goliath. Israelite soldiers were trained the same way the Philistines were, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But no one was going to defeat Goliath that way. No one was going to beat him in that kind of combat, especially not David. 
No one could match Goliath's strength or his size or his skill. You can't fight a giant on the giant's terms. You have to change the rules of engagement. You know, the worst way to fight a giant is up close with a sword. You know, the best way to fight a giant? With a slingshot at 20 paces. So while it seems as if David was totally unprepared, he was actually perfectly prepared. While it seems like he had wasted his time herding sheep, it's critical to note that the battle with Goliath wasn't won in the Valley of Elah. That's just where it was fought. The battle was actually won years before, out in the shepherd's field just outside Bethlehem. David's compensatory skill was using a slingshot. And he learned that not out in the battlefield. He learned that while serving as a humble shepherd. And that's where David learned some other compensatory skills too, like playing the harp and writing songs. Have you ever thought about this? David wrote some of the most comforting psalms in the midst of some of the most uncomfortable situations. You never know how God can use your trials to bless you in the future and to bless others as well. It was no doubt out on the field uh, when David wrote this particular psalm that has been a comfort to millions of people over the centuries. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't know if David wrote that psalm after he had seen uh, the bear and the lion attacking the sheep and felt like he had been in the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know whether David was writing about those animals attacking the flock when he wrote about his enemies, but I do know this, that that psalm breathes the heart of a shepherd. That's where David learned the skills that served him well later in the battlefield. I'm sure David rightly felt like he had been put out to pasture by his father. He wanted to be on the battlefield, but he was stuck in the shepherd's field. He wanted to be on the front lines, but he was stuck on the sidelines. But because David submitted to this season of preparation, God was able to use him mightily. David didn't have destination disease. He refused to focus all his energies on the next season of his life. He lived in the present and he enjoyed that season of his life. You know, it's so important to realize that there are seasons in your life when learning to follow is really more important than learning to lead, or when learning how to handle failure is, at this point, more important than learning how to handle success. There are even times in your life when learning to submit to authority is way more important than learning how to exercise your own authority. We sometimes think it's about entering into the right circumstances, but that's not true. Life is about becoming the right person. And sometimes the worst of circumstances bring out the best in us. So what we need to do is enjoy the journey as much as we can and realize that God will get us to the destination in his own time. It's true that the bigger the opportunity, the longer it takes God to prepare us for it. The reason we get frustrated is because we think big dreams without thinking long process. So be encouraged when it takes longer than you expected to get where you want to go. That simply means that God wants to do something more than you can even imagine with your little one and only life. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, Paul writes from a prison cell and tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God, the master artist, the master sculptor, he's working on each and every one of us and he will keep working if we'll let him keep working until that work is completed. In obscurity, God was chiseling away at David just like Michelangelo would do with his David statue hundreds of years later. And because David endured God's school of hard knocks, he developed those compensatory skills 
that made him a different kind of giant, a spiritual giant. In Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 16, Paul says that he is praying for the Christians in Ephesus. Here's his prayer. That God would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is saying, I'm praying that God does a work in your hearts and that you'll be able to understand uh, what he's doing and how broad and how high and how deep it is, that work that God is doing in you, and that your hearts will be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Your circumstances won't shake you because you'll realize that even in bad circumstances, God is chiseling away at your life. And then Paul says, now unto him, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Paul is teaching us. David's life teaches us. David's experience with Goliath, when he used a skill that he never thought would be worth anything to fight one of the biggest battles in Israel's history that forever changed the trajectory of his life and of that little kingdom. David teaches us that when God works, he sometimes works in ways that we would not desire and we would not ask for. Maybe God's working that way in your life today. Would you pray with me as we close this session and then we're going to discuss some of the principles that we've learned. Lord Jesus, again, I thank you for the chance we have to come together and learn principles from your word and discuss those principles among friends that are also serving you. Jesus, it's sometimes difficult to look ahead. And so we have to trust that your word is true, that your promise is true, that you are completing that work in us. Jesus, it's sometimes hard to go through circumstances where we feel laid aside or set back or held back. That must be how David felt when he was out in the shepherd's fields and everybody else was in battle. But Lord, you were preparing him for a work that he couldn't even imagine. I pray for someone today in our session that you would ignite this little flame of thought in their heart, that you would inspire them that just maybe what they see as a setback is really the chiseling of the master and you are preparing them for something so great in their future that even their own mind cannot imagine it. Lord Jesus, when we don't see what you're doing, we trust what you're doing. When we can't see your hand at work, we do trust your heart. Lord God, I pray for everyone in this session today that you would bless them with this kind of confidence, a holy confidence in you, the master artist. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.